Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Uh, just to explain, who do, those who don't know, as uh, Chris said, my name is Peter. I'm one of the leaders here. Our pastor, Dave, with his family, are away on holiday this week, uh, together with, I think, probably about half our church, actually, also away on holiday. So lucky them. Um, and, but it's great for us to be here uh, together today. So do turn with me if you have a Bible. Lots of the verses and so on will come up on the screen. But we're looking at Genesis and chapter 5. And we're looking at the title of Light in the Darkness. Now, I don't know what kind of week you've had this week. You may have come this morning feeling somewhat jaded. You may have had a hard week, a busy week. Uh, things may not be going too great for you. So I thought I would begin this sermon uh, to lighten the atmosphere a bit and talk about death. <laughs> now, death is something that we certainly try to avoid uh, most of the time. It's not a subject that we generally talk about. Um, but as someone wrote, in this present age, life is fatal. No one gets out alive, which is true, is it not? But death is a terrible thing. Death leaves loved ones utterly devastated. And it is an alien that seems to intrude into our lives all too often. And so it's, it's an issue that we sort of have to grapple with. Interestingly, of course, if you were following that passage a few moments ago, you'll realize that death is everywhere in that whole passage from the beginning to the end. So let's look at it a little bit together. But there is death. How did you get on with that passage? I must admit, when I realized I was the one who's got to preach it, I was not entirely overwhelmed with enthusiasm. And you probably weren't when you read it. Maybe you took the opportunity as we read it to catch up on your sleep this morning. Um, or you just sort of found yourself hard to concentrate as it just went into repetition, didn't it? It just seemed to be on and on and on and on. And uh, also for many of us, I think, when you first read it, you, you sort of scratch your head really, don't you? We've had quite a bit of narrative, really, chapters 1 to 4 of Genesis. And for those who are not aware, we're working our way through the first 12 chapters of Genesis on Sunday mornings. That um, we've had quite a bit of action and movement. And then suddenly we seem to lurch to a stop when we get to, to Genesis chapter 5. And we get this long genealogy of, of Adam, some 10 generations that are laid out before us in chapter 5. It reminds us, doesn't it, that it's not the only genealogy that we find in our Bibles, even in the New Testament. I mean, if you were going to write the wonderful story of the Lord Jesus, would you begin with a genealogy? But that's what Matthew's gospel does. And of course, when we read the wonderful stories in Luke's gospel of the birth of the Lord Jesus and uh, all the excitement of those opening chapters, at, at the end of chapter 3, it's as though Luke puts his foot on the brake and we have a genealogy. And you think, what's, what's this all about? Well, we have read uh, at the beginning of chapter 5 a repeat of what we've had early on in Genesis. When God created mankind. He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and he named them mankind when they were created. This wonderful story of the creation of man and the fact that we were made originally in the image of God. And we were given such possibilities, weren't we? Such beauty, such uh, wonderful abilities to do so much. But we know that because of Adam's sin, everything changed. So when we read verse 3 of chapter 5, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and his name he named him Seth. He had now a son, not so much in the image of God, but in his own image. That the image of God has now been spoiled. It has been fractured 
in mankind. It has not been utterly destroyed. So it's worth remembering that every act of kindness, every act of love, is an act that demonstrates that we still have something of the image of God in us, that image of beauty and love and kindness that we can still express. But now it has all been spoiled. It has been spoiled, and so we have read that uh, in chapter 4, for instance, the terrible business of murder that comes to the earth so quickly, and vengeance and a hatred for God, and a a rebellion against God, all the way through chapter 4. And of course, Chris has already reminded us, we don't have to turn to chapter 4 to know what is happening in our world, and this uh, seed of sin that affects us, in what has happened in Texas, in that primary school, just leaves us all aghast, doesn't it? And the dreadful things that are happening in Ukraine, the barbaric things that are happening, just leave us amazed in the 21st century, don't they? That we would ever see such things again. This is the world that we live. So why why has the writer of Genesis given us this this, um, genealogy? Well, I just want to say the reason is that although we may have been bored with it as we read it through, and we may have scratched our heads or we may have let our minds wander, it is actually written in such a way to alert us to something. Here it is, this opening verse. This is the written account of Adam's family line. That method, that sort of mantra almost, comes out ten times all the way through the book of Genesis. And every time it does, it is an alert to us to wake up because something is happening here. There is a new phase beginning to occur. And uh, the reality is that... um, we are really, it's, in fact, I was thinking, it's very much what my home group have, have come to understand as we read John's Gospel, where Jesus over and over again says, very truly I say to you, and we have learned in our home group that when you see those words from Jesus' mouth, very truly, it means, wake up you lot, because I'm going to tell you something that is so important, so vital, you must not forget it. In the actual Greek, it is amen, amen. Sounds odd, doesn't it? But it means this is emphatic. So we have here the beginning of something new. So what is it? What is happening here? Well, hang in there with me and perhaps we can learn together. One of the things we've noticed here, of course, immediately is these amazing ages of these people. I mean, they're really ancient, aren't they? And uh, I, my mother used to say about someone, oh, they're, the old, they're, they're as old as Methuselah. I don't think she ever knew what she was saying, actually, because she didn't know her Bible. But obviously, it was a saying where I lived. And uh, we know what it means now when we read here and see these massive ages. But the thing that is so striking about this passage is not the ages, because some people spend all their time trying to explain them away or try and give some sort of understanding of what's written here, because the ages seem so vast. But let's take it face value that these ages that are mentioned here are correct. But it doesn't matter what age these people were, the same end comes, doesn't it? Altogether, we're told in verse 5, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. And so we go on through these generations. Seth lived a total of 912 years, and then he died. And we read in verse 11, altogether Enosh lived a total of 905 years and then he died. And so it goes on. And it's in the original Hebrew, it's even more forceful. It's just one word. We write it out in English so that it sort of makes sense to us. But in the original, it just says, died. He lived 905 years, died. And so that force comes at us in the language. But that's not how it should have been. That is not how God created us. God did not create us for death. But you remember that this is the result of sin and of Adam's sin. Chapter 2 verse 15 makes it absolutely clear. The Lord God 
took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. What an immense privilege for Adam. What a wonderful job to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Do you get it? That is the curse of sin. The curse of sin is that we will die. And God told Adam that would be the result of his sin. And, of course, it's not just death which terrifies us. That there is that lurking sense that after death, there may be something else. And, of course, we're told in the book of Hebrews, just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. And so it's not just the physicality of death that the Bible alerts us to, but that once we pass from this lovely life for many of us, we pass into a judgment throne. We pass before the very throne of Almighty God. That is why death is such a curse. And that's what we have here in Genesis chapter 5. But of course, we don't end there, thankfully. If I stopped there, you'd be well depressed today, wouldn't you? Um, And uh, you'd go home um, really not feeling very happy at all. But there is hope in this chapter, believe it or not. I don't know whether there's anyone here who's done their genealogy. Is there anyone who's put their mind to it? Come on, own up. Have you started to work on your past and on all those relations that stretch away that you've heard a little bit about? I knew someone once who really took it seriously. He traveled the country, tracking down his family uh, through church registers and so on. Um, Even Linda, my wife, uh, uh, said she wants to do that for her side of the family. Notice. And um, she, she wants to do that, um, but when she has a bit more time, well, we we're still waiting for that moment when she has a bit more time to do the genealogy. Um, I have no interest in doing my genealogy. Um, my grandmother used to tell me about some of my relations, and they weren't very savoury characters, some of them, so I'd rather not know and be disillusioned by my family line. But here we have... A family line which is very distinct. Look at verse 25 of chapter 4. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And we suddenly see with the birth of Seth a sense of hopefulness because God has granted me another child in the place of the righteous Abel, the godly son of Adam, not of Cain, but of Abel. And so we see something here happening. And really, the whole of this genealogy that we have in chapter 5 is the genealogy not just of Adam, but of his son, Seth. Why is this hopeful to us this morning? Why is this here? Your answer's on a postcard. Are you with me so far? Well, stay with me, because this gets just a little bit complicated. Why is this important? Well, in chapter 3, we have that wonderful moment that although Adam and Eve have sinned, and they're now under the curse of that sin, just as, as we are, because those seeds of sin that we look at in, in Ukraine and in Texas, they lurk in all of us, and we all struggle with it. But, G, but we have here in chapter 3 where God promises something. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And we learn from Dave, our pastor, that that, of course, is the indicator of salvation that is to come in Jesus Christ. And it is to come through the seed of the woman. We have the seed of the serpent, which is 
contrary to everything that is God, everything that is beautiful and glorious and holy and righteous, it is Satan's job as the serpent to destroy it all on this earth, to destroy all the work of God. But we then have the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman we know is the Lord pointing forward, as we will see, none other to our Messiah, to our Jesus, to our Christ, our Savior. Somebody picked up in, on a Roman tomb somewhere. Uh, the, this was what the person wrote. I didn't exist. I existed. I don't exist. I don't care. In other words, someone writes, well, there was a time when I wasn't around. It's hard for us to believe that because we think the earth revolves because we're here. But there was a time when the earth got on extremely well and you and I were not around. But then we are around and then we're not. And this guy says, well, I don't care. And in Pompeii, which you'll know about, there's a, scrawled on a wall, I think, was once you are dead, you are nothing. And that is the general attitude probably of so many, isn't it? That we live this life as best we can and then we drop off the cliff. End of story. We drop off into nothingness. And so there is no continuity. There's no sense that, that any of this means anything. We are desperately in this mood in these days where everything seems so meaningless to so many people. But when we turn to Genesis 5... What do we read immediately? There's a sense of movement. We're given ten generations, and those generations go one after the other, after the other, and they're all stretching onwards. So it isn't like a full stop. Although they died, there's another generation that moves on from them. And so there is this sense of movement all the time. And of course... You will know, because it's one of the things I always say, that the Old Testament is full of that movement, isn't it? From Genesis chapter 5 onwards, there is this sense that there is no full stop here, but we're heading somewhere. There's a movement forward. It's like an arrow that's stretching forward to, to a, a, the bullseye somewhere over there. And so the whole of that Old Testament is drawing us on. And of course, where it's drawing us on... Is to the Lord Jesus himself. That is the point. That is the point of chapter 5. That what we have here is the generation or the line or the seed of Seth. The godly line. And that line is going to stretch through the centuries until it comes to Jesus. You don't believe me? Well, turn to look chapter 2. Oh, sorry, chapter 3. At the end of that amazing genealogy, which you and I always skip over, because we don't find it very inspiring, what do we read? Verse 37, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, there's Methuselah again, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel. That's good that I managed to say that, isn't it? I thought Evelyn did it brilliantly, actually. The son of Kenan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth. Do you get it? The son of Seth. So right back here in the midst of time is a generation being formed of Seth's line. And Seth's line is the godly line that will lead us on, always pressing forward until the Lord Jesus comes. In human terms, a descendant of Seth. Do you get it? What does that mean to us here? And it means this, that right in the mists of time, into the beginning of this world altogether, God had a plan of salvation. He announced it in Genesis chapter 3. He then pursues it through the line of Seth, through all the centuries of the Old Testament and all its t ups and downs and its sort of wrong turns and all of that. And yet, Always, inexorably, God is moving forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus, his Son, our Savior. And nothing, and this is the point for us, nothing will thwart God's purposes. Nothing will stop his plans or divert his promises. 
God has promised, and through those centuries, he has fulfilled that promise right back into the Lord Jesus. And that's why it's important for you and me this morning that although we read this strange chapter, we're reminded that God keeps his promises. He knows what he's doing. Nothing can thwart him in anything that he does. It doesn't matter what the serpent does in this world. God will have the victory. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. And he who has brought salvation through those centuries from that Genesis 3 moment is your God if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus this morning. If Jesus is your Savior, then that is the God that you are worshiping. A God who keeps his promises. A God cannot be faulted. A God who cannot be thwarted. A God who will achieve the glory that he has prepared for you. You may have had a really hard week. You, some of you I know are struggling with health issues. Some are struggling with family that uh, just cause you a great deal of pain maybe. Some of you maybe at work are just finding work really hard or, or just threatening. Some of us really struggle, don't we, even though we're Christian people. But even this chapter 5, which seems so strange to us, is actually saying God keeps his promises to his children. He will not forget his children. That the promises he has made for you, he will keep. And you and I, our work is to place our feet on the promises. When life is dark, when life is hard, when life just seems as though maybe even that God isn't there and you're alone, what are you to do? You turn to the promises of God and you place yourself in those promises and you don't rely on those feelings that overwhelm us and the darkness that can envelop us, but you place yourself right into the promises of God because you know whatever is happening in this world, the promises of God cannot fail. And his promises to you and me, my, my friends, will stand the test of time and will take us to glory. And so this chapter 5 is just saying, look, God works things out to his glory and for your benefit and my benefit in Jesus Christ. Trust him. You can trust him. And so we come just really to the, the last point in, in this Genesis 5. And you will have picked up, of course, and may even have woken up at that particular moment, that there is one moment that suddenly everything changes. And we don't read, he lived so and so and so and so, and then he died. We read something much more wonderful. Verse 21, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, oh, Methuselah Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God and then he was no more because God took him away. Suddenly there is a change and we read about Enoch that he doesn't die but he is taken away into the presence of God. What an extraordinary thing. But think of what that meant for the generations that were to follow Enoch. Immediately, that story will have been passed down from father to son and daughter to father and son and daughter and so on. That Enoch left this earth and went into the presence of God. In other words, to the generations to follow, there is an eternity. This world is not the end. The death is not the end. But there is a presence with God that comes after death. And for Enoch, he is an example of going into the presence of God without death. What a tremendous lesson for everyone to have learned that there is an eternity to come. It's an important lesson for you and I. We forget that. This earth is just gone in a flash, but eternity is forever. It's an awful long time. And so when you see this fact, you suddenly realize how important that was. But more than that, notice what it says. Enoch walked 
faithfully with God. Isn't that full of meaning? He walked faithfully with God. What, what did that mean? Well, it's very interesting that Enoch is mentioned in other places, and some of you will, will know about it. But uh, um, he is mentioned in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 as one of the, the great saints of the Old Testament. Verse 5 of Hebrews 11, by faith Enoch was taken from his life, from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. It's rather lovely, that's not people looking around for him. I mean, he'd gone. Um, he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you see what he means? It's explained for us in Hebrews what was true about Enoch. And that was that he knew God. That in the midst of the darkness, he was a man who knew God. And he trusted in that God. And I would say he loved that God. And the fact that he walked with his God means that his whole life was oriented around God. And this is an exceptional thing that we see in this man's life. And of course, what we're seeing there is just an example of what it is, as it were, in prototype, in em embryo form, what it is to be a Christian. We look forward to the Lord Jesus. Isn't that what it is to be a Christian? That we know him and we worship our Lord Jesus and we follow him and we love him and our whole life if we're truly Christians, is oriented around who? Well, our precious Jesus. That's how our life works. That's what gives our life meaning. And so there is this immense hope that we see, even in this primitive life of Enoch. But then also we're told something else about him. And it comes in the letter of Jude. Now, I have to say, Jude isn't a letter that I know terribly well. And Jude, if you want to go hunting for it, comes just before Revelation. And yet again, Enoch appears in this uh, little letter. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. Jude is writing, warning churches and warning us to look out for wolves in sheep clothing. Those who come and bring heresy into the church, who disturb the church, who break the church. And the whole of the letter of Jude is warning about this, and he uses Enoch as an example. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them, these troublers of the church. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them for, of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Pretty harsh words, aren't they? But that's Enoch. So what we're told in, he, in uh, Jude is that Enoch was a preacher. So he didn't just follow the Lord Jesus, or as it were in the Old Testament, follow the Lord God that he knew, looking forward to Jesus. But he actually preached. He didn't keep it to himself. He told people, and he warned people about the wrath that is to come, about judgment and, and eternity. And that is an example for us, isn't it? It is the fact that we have that responsibility to tell others about eternity, about the wrath to come, but particularly about the Savior who saves us from wrath. That is our job. That's why we're making something of the 19th of June. Now, for some of us, we're not able, perhaps, to, to bring anyone, and, and we understand that, but come anyway. Families, this is a family thing as well for the meal. We expect our children to be there and for us to have a great time together. But what an opportunity for, for those who might come to want to celebrate with us to hear about the Lord Jesus and to hear the gospel. And we need to pray, don't we, and seek opportunities that, like Enoch, we tell people about our Jesus Christ. But, you know, 
we can't leave this without just saying one other thing that must be uppermost in your mind as we look at this little passage about Enoch. And that is, he was no more because God took him. And that is the hope of all God's people, isn't it? That one day Jesus will come back. And even in this chapter, which is so mysterious to us, there is a flash of understanding that actually one day Christ will come and all God's people will gather to him. And the remarkable thing is that if you and I are alive upon this earth when Jesus comes, then we will meet him in the air and we will not know death. We will never experience death. Now there's something to look forward to for the coming of Christ. But whether we're alive or have been dead for centuries, we will meet our Savior in the air. And so you and I need to encourage each other with that thought. This week, we need to encourage ourselves that God knows what he's doing, that he works out his purposes meticulously. They cannot be thwarted. And you and I can stand on his promises, even when the world seems so dark to us. We can trust him implicitly and explicitly. And then we can look forward to our Lord Jesus, to know him, to love him, to speak for him, and to look forward to the great day when we will see him.